Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the spring term of the Optical Sciences Colloquium. Um, it's very nice to see so many of you and also like so many known faces here in the audience. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers this semester. So I encourage everybody, you know, to check the website and see, you know, look up the upcoming talks. It's actually going to be very, very interesting uh, this semester. And actually, we start today the series with a bang, because today we have uh, here Andreas Felten. So Andreas is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he directs the computational optics group. Um, Andreas did his PhD at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, so he's somehow familiar with the Midwest, and uh, he already told me that he's really much enjoying the food, right? And um, uh, and he did his postdoc at MIT in the Camera Culture Group. Andreas has many awards and honors. Um, too much to list all of them here, but uh, just to name a few. So uh, Andreas is on MIT's list of the top innovators under 35. And he's a senior member of OSA, SBIE, and NAI, as well as a Sigma Xi member. And Andreas, uh, this is the last thing I, I say, I promise. <laughs> so Andreas is also an entrepreneur. Um, he's the co-founder of Onloom and Ubicept, which are two companies which are also very well known in the computational imaging community. So Andreas, we are uh, very excited um, to have you here today. Uh, I think I never told you that, but um, actually your work was one of the works that motivated me to dive deeper into the topic of computational imaging. Mm -hmm. So when I first saw this video of this uh, light pulse traveling through the Coke bottle, I don't know if you will uh, show this today, actually. But when I first saw that, then I thought, OK, I need to understand how this works and I really need to study this. And yeah, this was Andrea's work. And um, yeah, with this, I give it up to you. Um, Andreas, we are very excited to have you here. And um, yeah, so a uh, topic or title of the talk is computational imaging photon by photon. So, yeah, thank you very much for the for the introduction. Thanks for for inviting me here. The great great day with a lot of lot of very interesting interesting meetings. Um, and um, yeah, unfortunately, the soda bottle video is not in the talk anymore. I <laughs> I uh I felt at some point I had to replace it because it's like uh, it's we did that a long time ago but it's still on YouTube it uh I actually it was one of the it's still one of the highest views on the MIT YouTube channel so if you go to the MIT YouTube channel and sort by views it's still one of the videos that got the most the most views um and it's fun to watch um still trying to figure out the scientific applications but <laughs> um, so um, I want to talk about computational imaging photon by photon. This is really kind of two different um, um, two different sections of the talk, um, and um, but they all use these photon counting detectors. So again, let's start by looking at like how does a regular camera image sensor pixel um, collect light, and how do we think? When we, when we do computational imaging, computational photography, how do we think about the light? So we're trying to measure something, this analog quantity called flux, right? And we think of this sensor as a light bucket. We have some light that kind of flows onto the pixel. We decide some exposure time, right? It's flux. We have to integrate over time. Otherwise, it doesn't actually exist, right? Um, so we decide some exposure time. And after the exposure, we check in our bucket how much light was in there. And um, that's that's how we measure this quantity. So this measurement of flux of this kind of energy that flows onto the pixel has some problems associated with it. Um, it leads to saturation, right? If your light bucket filled up before, like if you had too much light and your light bucket fills up before before your time is expired, you just know that there's more light than you than you could measure. You also have problems with motion blur, right? Again, the the, the mathematical concept of flux requires you to integrate over time. Otherwise, it doesn't actually exist, right? So if something was moving while you were integrating, you're going to get motion blur, right? Um, and that's very hard to remove computationally, even after it's, if you know what the motion was, it's, you can't really remove it anymore. Um, you have low time resolution, right? Again, you have to wait. <laughs> Again, you need to integrate over time. Um, you get some weird kind of, from this analog detection, you get some weird kind of noise that you have to deal with. and um, 
So why is this so hard? And um, well, okay, this is a little bit of a, um, a, a, a snarky formulation, but the problem is that flux doesn't actually exist, right? So we're trying to measure something that's not actually there, and that's why, why we get all these problems. So what's actually happening is, um, and this is the kind of red pill, right? The, red, <laughs> the, the pixel is hit by instantaneous discrete energy packets that are called photons, right? So, and in order to actually even define something that you can think of a flux, you have to wait for some time and average and, and this establishes average. And of course, if you're trying to be fast and trying to be optimal, that's not a good way to think about the problem. So why don't you just measure the photons and, and try to do that in imaging? So that's the, the underlying motivation. So, and the, the good news is we can do that now. There's many ways of doing this. What we're using is the single photon avalanche diets. So in the pixel, you have a little photo diet. Um, it's reverse biased, like most photo diets, I, I imagine even the ones in the normal camera pixel would be. But the worst, worst bias voltage is high enough so that a single photon getting in there will create an electron hole pair that then creates an avalanche, just like in a photomultiplier that you can detect. And then there's circuitry in there that reads, that detects this avalanche, it kind of shuts down the diet so it doesn't destroy itself, and it sends out a pulse. So this works like a Geiger counter for photons. Um, so you get this series of incoming photons that hit the pixel, and what your, what your detector sees, it detects and time tags the photons. You can time tag them with picosecond time resolution very accurately when the photon arrived, and then you're blind for a little bit. But the detector is, is resetting. So if there's one coming right afterwards, you miss it, and this is called the dead time, and then you're ready to detect the next one. So that's what the sensor sees. So um, you have this limitation of this, of this dead time, um, so that's a downside, but you can actually now get a list of photon detections on your sensor. So rather than making this free readout frame per frame of what was the flux, you actually get can think of it as just a list of, okay, we detected a photon at this location at this time, and the timing can be incredibly accurate. So, and I mean, the most prior application for these spat array sensors was LiDAR, right? So you send out a light pulse, you measure the time it takes for the light to come back to get a 3D image. But what we started doing is to think about them just to replace regular camera pixels, right? Because again, like I'm a physicist by training. So <laughs> my, my, my thing was like, we'll, we'll try to measure what's actually there. Try to have your camera be closer related to the actual physics behind it. And you should be find, finding something interesting, right? So that's one motivation. The other one is that, this is called the title, The Spad Revolution, right? These single photon avalanche diets are made in the same fabs, the same factories that make our normal camera chips. There's really no reason commercially why one should be more expensive or easier to make or harder to make than the other. So really um, commercial, like there's no commercial preference for one of them. You use the same infrastructure. So you really can pick which one works better. And then that's what the one that's going to get used. At least I hope <laughs> that our startup hopes that. Um, uh, for example, the iPhone has a fairly high resolution LiDAR in it, right? A commercial system. Canon just, uh, um, uh, they're actually starting to market a 3.2 megapixel spat array sensor. So these, the resolution of these is going up there. So you, you're getting to the point where you can really think of replacing a regular camera sensor with a spat array and then just playing with that and seeing what you can do with it. And that's the first half of the talk is going to be, uh, is going to be about that. So um, one of the first things we did with these spats for, for like kind of just regular image and photography was high dynamic range. And this is actually maybe surprising, right? Because normally we would say, these are single photon sensors, so they only work in very low light and they don't really work when scenes are very bright. So, um, okay, so how do you get high dynamic range? So um, in a conventional pixel, as I said, if you have low brightness in a scene, like for example, in this, um, in this uh, on the sign here, um, you get very few photons. In a medium brightness, you get your well filled up. And if you have too much brightness, your, your, your well saturates and you can't mix, mix, mix anything. So you have at low flux, you get noise issues from the, from, from, the, from the noise of your sensor. At very high flux, you get saturation. So you can't see the signal because you saturate. And there's this kind of Goldilocks zone in between where you measure all the photons and you don't neither have too much nor too little. And you can make a near perfect measurement. And that's the region, regime where normal CMOS cameras are very hard to beat. Um, but in the other two, um, we can perform better. So you have noisy and saturated. So um, there's actually, we, we wrote different papers about different ways of like trying to estimate the flux now with high dynamic range as a spat. 
I want to talk about the the most recent one. So let's think about a different way to estimate the flux in the sensor. We really want to know how many photons per second, what's the rate of for the expectation value of photons per second that, we, that we're getting on the pixel, right? And we have this fixed exposure time or some exposure time, and at a low light, we would get photons and they're far spaced very far apart, random times in between, and the space very far apart. Medium, they get closer together, and at high flux, they get very close together. Very, 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 the, the time between the photons is very short. So you can see that the brightness of the flux is just one over the average interphoton time. So instead of trying to count photons and then divide by time, I can also just measure the average interphoton time. Um, and yeah, the way this would, would go here, I would measure my incident photons. And um, I could, for example, define the time between after my dead time ends here to when I detect the next photon as an interphoton time, right? Because this is a random process. There's no particular, like in any point in this in this in this time series is equal. So I can turn my pixel on at any any time and wait till the first photon, right? And and define that as the interphoton time. I don't have to like measure the actual time between two photons, right? Um, um, so the interphoton time we define as the time between any time point in the on the pixel and the next photon, right? So I can turn on my pixel anytime, wait until they get the next photon, that's my interphoton time. And I want to know the average. Now, the interphoton time, if I make a histogram now, I just count a bunch of like, just I, I open my pixel at any times when it's convenient to me and measure a photon and say, okay, how long did I wait to this time? And then I take all these measurements and make a histogram. That histogram is gonna be an exponential decay because uh, in a Poisson process, the time between the events is exponentially distributed. And the decay of that exponential tells me what the flux was, right? So now I have a interesting way of measuring the flux. I just measure the photon timings and, and from that I calculate the flux. What is interesting about this one compared to how a normal camera does it is that I can do this on any number of photons, right? It, like it, if I wanted to count the photons and then divide by time, I would have to actually count all the photons. I at least know that I got 10% of them. In this case, even the first photon is going to allow me to fit an exponential to it and get an exponential of the flux. And um, so I can, this is, works more like an opinion poll, if you will. You can ask uh, any kind of subsample of your photons, okay, what's the flux? And they'll tell you, but you don't have to measure all of them. So this is an, a measurement that inherently has infinite dynamic range, right? So you don't have, well, there's, of course, there's practical limitations. You still don't have infinite time resolution and things like this, but, um, um, so we actually went and built this. So we had to do this with a single pixel detector because we couldn't find a SPAT array that actually can, can do the time tagging the way we wanted. So we actually built a camera with a scan single pixel. It takes a few hours to take a picture um, and then compared it with a conventional machine vision sensor. This is a Pelican imaging, like a thousand dollar machine vision camera. And we've set up the scene looking out of a tunnel that's challenging. Now at a long exposure time, five milliseconds, you can see that most of the scene is saturated, but you can see some of the low light Features like there, you can see uh, uh, um, um, so, something there behind a card. And then if you go to long exposures, I think five milliseconds is the shortest exposure that this camera can actually do. Um, and you can start seeing Mario there in the in the in the light. You still can't see into the light. You can see the the the, the, the sign now is completely gone. It's too dark, and you still can't see any of the structures inside the light. You're still saturate, even 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 at this short exposure time. Whereas with the spat, if you look at the timing, you can see that in a single five millisecond exposure, you can resolve all these features and then some. You can see still see what's going on in the light. In fact, what we tried in this system, we actually tried to saturate the pixel by shooting a laser pointer straight onto the pixel. Like I think we had like 200 milliwatt, and then. The, the thing has a like temperature control, so it overheats and then it shuts down. So uh, the basically, I would say the dynamic range is probably higher than the damage threshold. In that sense, it's dangerous. You're going to break the sensor before you before you before you run out of dynamic range. This is actual capture with a single pixel point scan. It's bad. Yeah. So uh, we don't. Um, there is other ways where you can get high dynamic range that don't re rely on the timing that you can implement on commercial current spats. This one, actually, we had to build our own kind of sensor because we needed very accurate time tagging. The problem with, uh, with, uh, with, this, with most of the spats is, so the length of the dead time window is not very accurate. 
the timer that, that times how long the pixel switched up if it turns on is very approximate. And we need to know exactly <laughs> when we were opening so if we can actually get the interarrival time. So that we had to modify the pixel in order to do that better. Um, like it's not like usually you don't care and that's why they don't build them that way, build them with very accurate interphoton timing. So uh, this was a single pixel, but there's other techniques that we did with, a, with an array. So, yeah. Heuristic time then. So if you did, did you, you know a picosecond pulse and your, your dead times on the order of a picosecond, do you lose all the high dynamic range capability for that specific pulse? If it's because so, I mean, this, this is not positive. It's just continuous, continuous light, right? So you just get photons at random. So you always, always, always image them. If you, so, I mean, you, you can use them for, for picosecond time resolution, right? The thing is usually, usually if, let's say you have a pulse that, that comes a picosecond pulse at like 10 megahertz rep and you're trying to image that, what happens is usually you don't, you get less than one photon per pulse anyways. So what you do is you capture lots of photons and then afterwards, try to find some correlation, some pattern in it, and you can reconstruct the pulse train from the photons, right? So usually usually you, you get less one than one photon per pulse. So you're not missing anything. The time resolution is really the resolution which which you can time tag the photons, which is down to picoseconds. Um, okay, so that's one. You can actually get high dynamic range out of these things rather than like they're only being low light. The other interesting, um, interesting, uh, um, Aspect, of course, um, that the photon detection, the, pho the, the, the event of the photon actually being detected, detected is essentially instantaneous, right? Like, um, like the, the, the time the photon, like, but that is, it takes time to register, but you can pinpoint, I mean, there's some kind of drift time, I guess, between the electron and the hole in the semiconductor and something that, that, that like depends on where it's being absorbed. So it would be hard. But like, even with all of that, you get down to tens of picoseconds, which, for any kind of photography application is infinite, right? That's actually something I did for the laser pulse of the soda bottle because we kept ask, people asking us, can you make a video of a bullet going through? And um, I asked the question, well, okay, a bullet would take about a month at that time resolution, a picosecond per frame, but is there anything that would go fast enough so it would actually be moving in this video? And the answer is like nothing that's made of matter because it would have to be accelerated to near the speed of light, and it would be so energetic that would, it, again, it's not, it's not something that happens often. So, so for all intents and purposes, if you do imaging with anything real moving around, these things have infinite time resolution that the photon detections, which means they're very interesting for, for moving objects, right? And that's also something we learned that, so I told you this thing works very, very good for low light. Um, we try to demonstrate with the other camera, and then we turn out if we lower the light level so much that at a normal like exposure time of the camera, like I don't know, 50 milliseconds, that you that you have that it's challenging for the other for the normal camera to actually create an image. You have so few photons that even if you had a perfect camera, you don't see much. Like at least at at if you if you want to do photography, if you if you can do millisecond exposure times in photography in a handheld camera, the camera is not your problem. The noise from the camera doesn't hurt you, it's, a, it's the photons that's the problem. You just don't have enough photons at the short exposure times at the low light. Um, and even the perfect camera, the best camera, if you could build a perfect camera, it still wouldn't solve the problem. What you have to do is you have to fix the motion. And that is what the SPAT can do for you. Um, now, um, so this is a motion blur problem, right? So you have a, 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 an, a, an object that's moving, you can do a long exposure, but then you get this kind of blur together, which is the convolution of the motion of the object and the kind of exposure function, right? You can do a short exposure and then you get a noisy image without the motion, right? And the thing is in a normal CMOS camera, this read noise that you get per, per readout is actually goes up with short exposure because everything heats up and everything. So if you try to make this like shorter, you actually get more noise. Um, so um, the solution, and this is actually implemented in your cell phone now, this burst photography algorithm, right? It actually, instead of capturing one image, it captures a short video of lots of frames. Then it picks one keyframe and it tries to align all the other frames to that one keyframe and then adds everything together. So you get, you get, and you can of course then pick the other frames and make a video out of that. So you have something that, that has no motion blur and no, um, and, and low noise. That works surprisingly well. The algorithm is actually very well, even for, I'm gonna show you something later, like just using that normal burst algorithm, it works really well, even for very complex motion. 
It's a very smart, like, I'm not gonna go into details of the algorithm, but it works really well. The problem is, again, if you do this with a regular camera, you still have to figure out what your exposure lengths should be, right? If you have to, like, like you have to know a priori how fast the object is, how bright your scene, if you have different things in the same scene, you, you, like, you can't choose reason and exposures, right? And again, with a normal camera, Usually the noise goes up with frame rate. So if, if like you get readout, every time you read out, you get some noise. So more frames just add more noise. And then the readout noise goes up if you increase the frame rate. So you really don't want to capture faster than you can. And it's bad you have you have no such problem. You get the, the full resolution at all times, right? So the goal then is to capture an object here, detect the photons, and get rid of the motion. Um, and basically, um, like from this video, learn what the motion is, then correct for it, add everything together and get a deep blurred, denoised image. Um, and what we do in this case is we detect these flux change points, right? So you pick one pixel there in that video and you look at, this is actually the photon time of arrival. So long time of arrival means dark, short time of arrival means bright. And then you can see that clearly something changed over here, right? So what we do is we take, in the end, this is an event camera, right? We basically try to algorithmically find these change points. Say, okay, I want to piecewise constant flux estimate on, on top of this, right? And you do this for all the pixels. And now you can, you have, you can sample this as a video. You can sample this now at any time point, right? And make a video at any frame rate you choose. We call this a change point video and that video even for very noisy data, has enough information to figure out what the motion is, and um, then you 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 basically just align them and merge them together to get this to get this image. In this case, the motion model was very simple. Right, um, we didn't deliberately didn't look at more complex motion. In this case, the, all the all the align and merge can do is translation and rotation, <laughs> right? So it doesn't do anything more more, more sophisticated. We also did apply this more complex motion model that's done in burst photography. And what burst photography does is it does kind of this hierarchical pyramid structure. It starts with very large patches and tries to mer like merge them. First at very low resolution, like to look at global motion, and then it goes to smaller patches in the image and, and aligns them. And the, like basically in each layer, you denoise enough so it can go to the next higher resolution layer. And it can actually do this very complex motion in the scene to do this. Now, we didn't do that. We just applied the algorithm to our SPAT data. So here is, is one data set that I found very, very interesting. So this is raw data with a 32 by 32 pixel sensor, 50 frames of data. So just a few thousand photons in total. And the color here encodes the time. So um, actually, we, we inverted it. So, so the, the bright is early detection. So that's bright signal. Dark means late detection, or no detection, which means there's, there's less signal there. So, um, and I'm going to play the video. So this is the data. Right. So this is the raw data, and I press a quick uh, like, can you figure out what's going on? I, I guess you can't. I can't, but you can see that there's some large scale motion going on, right? You can see there's some big white thing that gets smaller, and then if you look at the top, there's also something kind of moving downwards a little bit. It turns out that's enough to get started for the algorithm. So that's enough for the first step of finding this change point for you, finding your motion, and then you can do the first large scale motion correction, and then haggle your way down. And then um, the actual video looks like this. Right. And you can see how it actually gets down to the deformation of the rubber. Of course, we don't have ground tools, so, but it looks real. It looks realistic, right? Um, Right. So it can actually, and then this can do it from just a few thousand photons, right? Because, I mean, you didn't have any motion blur in the first hand. So if you can figure out what the motion is, you can, you can go and, and correct for it perfectly. Right. This is a balloon being hit by a dart. Yeah, so there it. Sorry, yeah, I should have said that, yeah. So there's a dart coming, falling down, and it hits the balloon, and the balloon bursts. Um, okay, so this is uh, basically the the, the basic um, kind of um, 
um, um, research on on, the, on on fluorescence cameras. We have been doing some work on on, on like making these higher resolution, and um, uh, I think this these first some of those first things like Mohit Gupta and I did them together. Mohit has kind of branched out and gone to bigger resolution and added color and doing done, done a lot of like computational improvements to to processing these. And we have like started like branching out to kind of different applications. One that I'm very interested in is fluorescence and, and surgical. This demos that I'm showing you now are actually not with single photon cameras yet. They're just with high frame rate regular cameras. So this is a picture from a from a from a from a surgery from this is from our startup. And um um this um so this mouse has a can a tumor in it and um with a bare eye, it's very hard to see where that tumor is. And the dirty secret is it's also very hard to see for the surgeon. So they don't really know what they what they need to cut and what they need to leave in. But in this case, the mouse had been given a, I think it's GFP, some fluorescent dye that that specifically gets metabolized in the tumor and becomes fluorescent in the tumor. So if you look at this with a fluorescence camera at the right wavelengths, you can you can see the the, the compound in the tumor light up. And then in our camera, we can overlay the two, right? And the, the we, basically the, the the IP we started this company with was a simple trick that this is, is a, just a white light illumination LED, right? And then we have the fluorescence camera and the white light LED is flashed at like 5% duty cycle at 300 Hertz or something. So to the human eye or to the to this camera, it just looks like normal white light, but it's off 95% of the time. Right, because it only sends out short, 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 short light flashes. And in between, you can have your fluorescence camera do its thing and capture fluorescence with very high sensitivity. And then you can combine them. And even if you have visible light fluorescence like this, um, you can still render very high quality images with the lights on, um, which before they actually were doing switching lights off during the surgery in some cases. And you can also see here. So now she's actually operating. And so, so she just, uh, this is actually, she can do live surgery on like using this screen image and remove the tumor. And again, there's a lot of compounds in the pipeline to actually do this labeling, people developing a lot of different fluorescent compounds. Um, and yeah, we've been looking into the, into the cameras to do this. Um, this you can see there is a little bit of tumor left over there. Let me do contrast here. That like that definitely wouldn't have been able to see that without the fluorescent agent. Um, this is another one. Maybe. Um, maybe we can play this quickly. This is now compounds that label different things. So there's a tumor in there that you want to cut out, but there's also nerves. So you can see that big white thing there is a nerve over here. And there, of course, it's easy to see, but then when it goes into the muscle, it becomes very thin and it becomes very hard to make out where the nerve is. Now, um, and in this case, the nerve also has been labeled with something. So you can see the ends of the nerve that you have to avoid. And there is, I mean, there's examples, like I think the two statistics that have in my head, like uh, uh, prostate resections, they have a lot of nerves around the prostate that you need to avoid that are too small for the human eye to see. And so the doctor has to cut around them and avoid them. And the, the, the success rate is about 50-50. So half the time they, they come out fine and half the time that you lose some function. Um, usually it's uh, um, like control, you need a catheter or something. And I think the, the big, uh, um, like the, the, the cancer surgery, I think it's about 80% of breast cancer surgeries or 20% of breast cancer surgeries have to go for resurgery because not all of the tumor was removed. So this could make a big difference. Um, what we are trying to do is improve the quality you get from this from this from these signals because the 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 lower signal you can get can can work with some more challenging fluorophores you can get down to actually doing things like autofluorescence right so these tumors actually fluoresce by themselves you don't need to actually put anything in but fluorescence is just much more complex and much dimmer so in order to be able to use that and maybe in the future do surgery without needing all these compounds and everything we would need much more signal strengths and um so what we've been trying to do now is with this system now we have this white light view and the fluorescence view, and um, we can do this kind of denoising that I showed you before, 
but we can cheat, right? Because we know the motion from the white light view, right? So in this case, um, we have uh, our reference image, which is like, this is a piece of chicken thigh from the supermarket. Um, and we injected some uh, fluorescent dye into the veins here. And um, this is the ground truth, which is what our fluorescent image camera on the system actually sees. And then we just messed it up, added a lot of noise. And then we train an algorithm to use this image and this video to kind of uh, get us a denoised video, right? And the simplest thing you can do is, um, or the, the simplest cue you can use is that um, you can get all the motion information from here, right? And then and then and use it there. But there's of course other information in this image, like different segmentation and everything that the algorithm could use to improve this. This was the first try. We have things that work much better now, and um, I mean it's still kind of an open problem. Interestingly. The best thing with that works is just a standard image denoiser. All the video denoising tools don't work as well as just denoising image by image with the best state of the art image denoiser. Um, but um, yeah, so um, of course it, that works very effectively. It also is much less prone to hallucination because it has this ground truth image that it can can work with, right? So. Um, like uh, a normal deep learning algorithm that you ask to denoise this would give you might give you a beautiful image, but it will may, may remove the nerve that you want to actually wanted to avoid cutting. Um, this wasn't real time. I think we have an algorithm like that that can run in real time on a GPU now. Um, this one this one uh, took a long time, but this this at this stage can run in real time because it's mostly just the same burst photography alignment thing. And we have um, we have several versions of that now that run in real time. But this one didn't. Um, and then once we're doing now, we're going to the like more sophisticated algorithm part. So it's, it's not real time. The other thing is, um, so it, it, there's a runtime. And then most of the video denoising out there, including this algorithm, actually do this thing where they like, you run the algorithm once on the video forward and once backwards, which get, gives you much better results. Um, but of course that doesn't work on an online system. So one thing that we're also doing now is like, what if you only have the past and you, you, don't, you, don't, have, you don't know the future? Um, okay, so that's all I had about the fluorescence. So the second half is about our non-line of sight. How much time do I have? Okay, I can can talk a little bit. So it's kind of now we're shifting gears a little bit. Um, I guess we do all the questions together afterwards. Yeah, and so we're shifting gears a little bit. So non line of sight imaging. It's actually so the non line of sight imaging research was what I did before I did all this single photon stuff, and the kind of spat sensors that we're using right now. We came across them because we were looking for something better for non line of sight imaging. The first non line of sight imaging systems were done with a streak camera, which just not something practical. And if I hadn't come across this path before, we wouldn't be doing non line of sight imaging anymore today because <laughs> um, it's, it's, it wasn't a practical system. So non line of sight is, um, the idea is, um, so we have something that's very similar to a LiDAR system, right? So we, we have our camera here, we can we send light pulses into a scene on this relay wall, but our goal is not to image, to get an image of the relay wall. We wanna image into this hidden scene and image what's around the corner. Right, so when we can send pulses to the wall, light goes in, it interacts with the scene, and then we can image what comes back to the wall with a camera over here, right? So we know where on the wall, we, where and when on the wall we transmit and where and when on the wall we receive the light, but we don't know the, the, the scene that actually created that pattern. So the goal then is to reconstruct a picture of the hidden scene. And this is actually an image from the lab. This is a scene in the lab, and this is the image of the reconstruction. Um, so that's what, we, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we're trying to do. And um, well, uh, so we have a bunch of degrees of freedom, right? You can, we can scan the laser pulse, we can illuminate any point, point we like, right? And we can look, we can focus our camera or look at different camera pixels so we know different locations, right? And if you do this, if you send your, shoot your laser pulse on the one point there, and you look at the signal from these two different camera pixels on our spat, you get these time responses, right? And yes, this is basically a histogram. This is basically what you ask, right? So basically you, you get less than one photon per pulse, but you get like, 
you have 10 million pulses per second. So if you wait for a little bit and you make a histogram, you still see this kind of time response coming out. And like all these peaks basically just correspond to different parts of the object, right? Because um, like for example, in for the blue, um, the top of the chair is a certain path length. So that light arrives at a certain time. And then if you go to the red spot, that path length changed now, though that peak has to move as well, right? Because now it takes it, it's a different travel time. So the timing here somehow encodes the travel time of the light, the round trip time between the pulses. So if you do the scan for the enough points on the wall, you can use this to reconstruct this image of the hidden scene that I showed you. Um, and we have done a bunch of different algorithmic approaches to doing this. Um, the one we've done more recently um, is to kind of think of this as a wave propagation, a virtual wave problem. Um, and this, <laughs> this, this way of doing it always doesn't fly with computer scientists. It works very well with optical scientists because they, they like to think about waves. So, um, 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 so the, the, the idea here is that, well, the scene is basically just a linear system, right? So, and what I'm doing is I'm sending a delta function into the scene and then seeing what comes back up, I'm capturing the impulse response of the scene, right? This is what it looks like as a function of space and time. So let's propose what I did here was send the laser to one spot and I had the spat array that captured the light coming back at all times. So that's what it looks like. It's the impulse response of the scene from that point, right? At the relay wall. Now, if I know the impulse response of a linear system, I can compute the output of the system for any input, right? So now I actually can computationally pick anything I want to send in the scene and see what would come back out. So, and because I like waves, well, I just say, okay, I want to, I want to send this wave packet in, right? Of course, this has to be like this wavelength that I use has to be like centimeters or so because that's my time resolution, right? My time resolution here, pulse width is about like a few centimeters. So my, the wave packet I design here that I convolve with this has to be longer than my delta function, right? But basically I just convolve my captured data with this kind of wave packet system. And then what I get is what would have come out of the scene if I actually had sent in a signal that looked like that, like the wave, and that's just a wave plot, right? So now I could send this off to an ultrasound engineer and tell them, here, this is what I captured. Can you reconstruct an image? And they would do it, right? It's just a wave. Or I can, if you do digital holography, whatever, like all the waves, like the, the, the math is always the same, right? So the, the beauty of this is now we can, we can just use existing operators like Rayleigh Sommer filter fraction. That's what we, what we use as this fast methods of solving that out there. Um, that's what we use to do the reconstruction. And also to me, it's also, it gives you a very, nice way of reasoning of what's going on here, right? It's just a wave you're reflecting off of things and it's gonna behave like a wave. And, and uh, a lot of the things that I'm gonna show you later, is basically just <laughs> taking that idea, like it's just a wave, it should behave like a wave and just trying to see how far we can take it. Um, so basically this is uh, the, the direct reconstruction here. We have the capture of signal, impulse response of the scene. We convolve it with this virtual wave, right? Um, that gives us this, this wave front at the relay wall. And then we use a diffraction operator, Rayleigh Sommerfeld, um, to solve it. I actually didn't know that there's a convolution. This can, you can write it as a convolution and solve it as a convolution. From my optics classes, I always thought you have to go to the, the Fourier <laughs> like, uh, or Fresnel operator to do a convolution. But um, this is still a convolution. You just can't analytically write it down, but, but computationally, you can still solve it as a convolution. So it's still at, just as fast. Um, so, um, so this is a reconstruction. And now, um, I mean, this reconstruction, of course, is what this, what this our our virtual camera sees at the relay wall as this virtual wave. So it actually can you can actually play this back as a function of time. Right. So now you see your virtual pulse moving through the scene and illuminating all these different objects. Yeah, this is where the projector contrast really starts. <laughs> and now it hits the back wall and then we play a little more because then something interesting is happening. And then there's another stuff coming from the site. So, 
this is a little grainy. Maybe I'll play it again. So this is a scene. Again, this is just a 3D reconstruction of the scene viewed from the side. And you see the chair over here, the back of the chair. This is this kind of box with the posters in. There's a shelf here. You can see some of the books. Um, and this big wall that we set up in the back. You don't see this because it's actually occluded by the shelf. It's in this perspective. You don't you don't see the shadows in the right locations. Um, this actually is a shadow of the chair. It just like it's a weird it's a weird perspective. So, but let, now let's play it back. So we're actually seeing this virtual pulse that we made coming from the center of the scene and illuminating the scene. And again, this is just like solving the Rayleigh operator and like playing it back as a function of time. And um, you can see that, yeah, we first see the chair light up and then the shelf behind it and this kind of Amazon box here. And then the chair lights up again, right? And then eventually you see the stuff back here, there, that's the wall. And then you have light coming from the side and washing over the seat. So well, some of these make sense as like just that's just light with the pulse going out, but there's more going on here, right? So the first thing you see is the chair light up. That's just light coming from over to the pulse, hitting the chair, coming back. We image it. Then you see this stuff there, the the shelves in the back light up. Well, that's also just the light just takes longer to get there, right? Um, and that's why we see it later. But then you see the chair again. So what's that? Well, that's light that hit the chair, went back to the wall, hit the chair again. It came back to the wall, and then we see it. So it happens, you see it later again. So you see a fifth bounce. So that's light. Actually, yeah, it took five bounces, right? It went from the laser to the wall, to the chair, to the wall, to the chair, to the wall, and then back to the to the camera. So five bounces. And we can still reconstruct an image from that. Um, and then you see the, the stuff that in the back. And then you see the thing that coming coming across the scene from the light. And that's a fourth bounce of light that hit, bounced off the side of our, of our lab, which you don't see in the picture. It's right, right next to the edge of the of the field of view there and goes across the scene. So I mean the, the thing is here um, we actually can we have actually for this virtual camera we have a complete um, uh, uh, like we, we, we have a we can make a complete video transient video of the scene. So we can actually capture data that looks very similar to what we captured with our physical system at the relay wall. But now we're looking from the from the camera in the hidden scene. One way to think of this is um, so if we actually, and this is like kind of where we're trying to go in the in, in the future, right? Right now, we don't have large enough spatter rays to actually look at the entire wall. So we just have one point where our virtual light source comes in, and then we scan the laser to make a, a virtual camera. If we if we have enough spats to have a spatter ray that covers the wall and an illumination to, uh, that covers the wall, right? We can synthesize waves to send into the scene as well, right? Then we, we basically have a complete holographic camera projector pair that works at this virtual wavelength. So you can really, like the data set you capture basically has everything there is to know about the scene at this at this lower wavelength, right? And you can do any kind of imaging system you might want to implement. You can just do it in post-processing. You just have to deal with the fact that you have to have this lower wavelengths and you, you, can't, you can't go to optical resolution anymore. Um, okay, so, okay, so this, was done with a single pixel detector, as I said. So this, we're kind of moving these things around. You can either scan your spat, your detector, and leave your laser in space, in, in, in space, or you can scan your laser and, and just look from, and that's the same data set. You can just swap the labels, and it'll, it'll, it'll give you the same thing. So it's less Helmholtz reciprocity in this. Um, and um, so in this case, we just cho chose to scan the laser, and we had a single pixel spat that was just looking at, that's our virtual light source, right? And it was looking at the center of the wall. Now, um, and that takes forever because we don't collect a lot of the photons that come back from the wall, right? Only the ones that are at the wall where the spot actually looks like, everything else is lost. So you lose the vast majority of the light that you could have captured is just not detected because you're only one pixel. So the key to making this something more practical that can run in a millisecond rather than like two hours is to just add more pixels. So that's what we will be doing. We have to higher resolution cameras, spat cameras with more pixels. This was done with a 28 pixel system. 
Um, and that was enough to actually capture and reconstruct in real time. So we capture enough, enough light so in, we can do about five complete captures per second. So I think, yeah, 200, 200 milliseconds exposure um, is enough. So this is actually a, a, a live demo. This is a running reconstruction here, and here's the object, and there's a wall in between. This is the imaging system. Um, here's a display, and in a little bit, student is going to come in and start moving the object around. You can see that the, there's some latency in the reconstruction, but it it follows what's going on. And he's going to come in. He's, oh, now he's going to do some exercise. I mean, the motion is actually interesting in this, right? Because again, you capture photon by photon. So right now, it just reconstructs frame by frame. But um, you could probably have this react very quickly to changes or something because you have this really high time resolution. It just takes so much to, to it. This is a very interesting one. So this is two things showing here. You don't need the lights to be off. There is a little bit of improvement in SNR, but it's not very big. Um, but also what he's doing there, a 3D scan of a mirror is very hard to do. <laughs> like with a LiDAR, or there's a lot of technologies that try to do that. It's very tricky. But you can see for the non-line of sight camera, both sides of the mirror roughly look the same. Um, and it's because it, it probes the mirror from all the different angles, right? It, 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 there's no, like there is a specular reflection, but in the reconstruction that all gets mingled and whether the, it, it all depends on timings and the timings don't change. As long as you catch the light, you're good, right? Uh, so that's kind of uh, interesting. Um, side note, I'm not going to play this whole thing. He's just going to do some more. Um, because I wanted to talk a little bit about the more recent things that we've done. This is something that was just published. This was actually, we, uh, this is collaboration with, um, we borrowed Pavel's laser. This is the, 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 the Pavel's laser, Pavel's laser. And this was one of the first things where we, where we've been, 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 uh, been using some of the data for that. Um, Okay, so we can see around corners, and um, the question now is, okay, here's our hidden object, camera and laser, hidden object, it's all really a wall. Um, what if our, we have two corners to see around, right? And um, the way we are solving this problem in this case is really just, well, just believe that there's a virtual wave and use it, right? Because this wall back here is completely flat at that wavelength. So that wall should be a mirror to the virtual wave. So this approach is, I don't know how this light. So, so three bounds is not enough. So you have five bounces here, right? So idea, the, 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 the idea here is you have this virtual camera over here, right? And um, if you have this nice flat wall over here in the hidden scene that, again, at a centimeter scale where your virtual wavelengths lives, that's a mirror. It's flat. All you should have to do is to reconstruct over here. Just use your same reconstruct. Don't change anything. Just reconstruct this area. You should see the object. And well, you have to tweak it a little bit. And it's like the SNR is very challenging there and you have to set it up right. But essentially that's, that's the idea. There's no new algorithm, nothing. <laughs> it's just like, like just treat this as a mirror and you're good. Um, so basically you're just like, instead of reconstructing over there, you reconstruct over here and you see the object. Um, the hidden object, so this is, um, there's no object, and then you can see that the reconstruction doesn't show anything. And if you set up this little single patch, um, you can see a reconstruction. And if you set up this letter T, you can um, you can uh, you can see something that kind of looks like a T. And then if you flip it upside down, it flips upside down. Now, this resolution is, I mean, part of the reason why this resolution is so low is because it's very far away. 
right? Um, and our resolution is not very good to start with. So if you could further away, it goes down, but it's still, the resolution is lower than what you would expect from looking at a mirror image. And we don't really know why. <laughs> so there's still a, this, this looks very much like speckle what's limiting us. And um, yeah, we know the speckle is oftentimes a real limitation, but we don't really understand where they come from. This is not measurement noise. You can take this data twice and get exactly the same reconstruction. So this is not Poisson or measurement noise. So this, this is something that's completely deterministic. We just don't know what it is. <laughs> um, um, so the other application, and this is the last thing I have, uh, I guess we, so, so the other application, um, and this is another um, kind of interesting uh, uh, thing we ran across with this non line of sight reconstructions. So we can see around two corners. Um, but the results are kind of crappy right now. Um, what we also can do um, is we can solve this missing cone problem. And um, this is less exciting because most people don't know what that is. But um, so let's start explaining that. Um, so uh, we wrote a paper at some point, which uh, uh, um, was a poster in CVPAR actually, about this problem, which we noticed in the data. And if you look through the net, net literature, you notice, also notice that. So let's see, this is our non line of sight scene. Right? So this is our relay wall here. And this is our hidden object. So if you try to reconstruct that object with that relay wall, no matter what algorithm you use, as long as it's time of flight, like non line of sight, the reconstruction, so this G1, G2, 3, the reconstruction is going to look like this. Right? G1 and G2 are going to be perfectly visible, and G3 is not going to be there. Uh, and so the reason why that happens, so at the time we actually, uh, you can, you can, you, the, we, we had a much more mathematical and models of the radon transform and showed why the, the information there is missing. And that's the path that this paper goes down. Um, the reason we did that is I didn't want this to look like a shortcoming of, of our particular phaser field algorithm. <laughs> um, but the phaser field algorithm, so this is a fundamental problem. This information is just not in the data. One way to think of it is that um, if you actually look at the time response getting from the signal, it kind of averages out. There's no time, <laughs> time uh, resolved information anymore. Um, but in, with the virtual wave, it's actually kind of very intuitive what's happening here, right? Because again, these act like mirrors, right? So if I think I have my virtual light source here that sends my virtual wave pulse out, it reflects off of this and gets into the camera. Everything fine, I can see that mirror. This one, I'm good too. With this one, the virtual wave is not gonna come back, right? So whatever kind of intensity modulation I'm gonna send out from here is gonna propagate in this direction, right? And even though my camera is still gonna see the reflected light, it's not gonna be modulated anymore, right? The intensity, so basically, the, if, I, if I send a intensity modulated wave here, whether it's a pulse or some kind of um, uh, uh, intensity that gets brighter or darker, that's gonna go to the scene. And then if you look over here with your detector, you can see that modulation, you can see it get brighter and darker. Over here, all the intensity modulations over this entire area are gonna average out and you're just gonna see a uniform bright signal. Right. So again, the same math that that explains why there's no mirror reflection over there because the, all the, the waves destructively interfere, they'll also destructively interfere whatever time modulation you're going to try to send it. Right. So you're going to see it over here. You're not going to ever see anything time of flight over there. Um, of course, you can still see the edges of the mirror, so you can still kind of reconstruct it. Um, so now how do we fix this? So this is a very nice way of explaining what's happening and kind of understanding, but how do we fix it? So, um, and um, well, I mean, the, the answer is um, similar to how, again, think about how I have a dark room with a mirror in it and I wanna find the mirror, how do we do it, right? Um, and I'm standing there with my light source, right? So if I just shine my light source in the mirror, I'm not gonna see anything with lights coming back. But if there's something else in the room, maybe I can see that in the mirror, right? So what we can actually reconstruct actually very good with these, with these virtual mirrors. So this, in this scene, we have, again, this is our relay wall. There's a non side imaging system over here. This is our virtual light source, virtual camera. There's an object over here and a surface over here. This surface is in the missing code. We're not gonna be able to reconstruct that directly, but we can see this one and we can see the reflection of our virtual light source back here. So if I 
If I reconstruct back here, I'm actually going to see the reflection of the virtual light source. And, um, and in that mirror, I can also see the reflection of the reflection of the virtual light source. So basically, I mean, you can imagine if you actually were to set this up, right? Put yourself in a, in a gym with a large mirror on the side. You put a mirror over here. You're going to see yourself in that mirror, and then you see the reflection of reflection in that mirror. And if you put a light source there, you can see that. The, nice, the, nice, the, the reason why the light source is much easier to see is because it's much brighter, right? But uh, basically, you just this is kind of this mirror cabinet. And if you're looking at the light source, you can actually go via multiple reflections. We went up to nine in simulation. And you still see all these points in the in the reconstruction where this mirror image of the virtual light source that you created appears. And if you find them all, you can find all the mirrors, right? So that's that's the, the thing here, right? You can directly reconstruct this one, and then you can reconstruct this wall, this hidden wall that you shouldn't be able to see using this virtual mirror reflections, which again it uses in some way it uses the higher order bounces, right? I think you can you can prove that with just third bounce light, you can't see these um, these missing cone objects but if you add more higher higher order reflections they actually come and 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 enter your reconstruction so we can we can reconstruct these otherwise hidden surfaces but this is just i mean right now again we still have this thing where we just have a virtual point light source so we can't do waveforming and uh, kind of project our light in the, in the virtual source so we need this virtual these mirror surfaces and actually to go around the next corner Next step is now, if you actually have a spot array, we could, we could see around the next one of our more complex scenes and just try to incorporate more scattering. And then maybe one thing to close is, um, there's always this thing of saying, oh, this is very, very, I mean, you, it's this, exposure time is so long and it's just so, uh, so, so noisy that you're never going to be able to use it for. But if you think about it, like how much light is actually lost during the scattering, right, in a room with, like this room has gray walls, but most rooms have white walls all around. You lose 5% of the photons in every scattering event. So they actually scatter around the room a lot. <laughs> it's more a ma ma matter in, in, in an enclosed space. It's more a matter of, oh, can I actually still make sense of what I'm seeing? I don't think it's, I don't think there's a fundamentally a signal level problem if you're able to actually use a large area of the surfaces that you have um, into, the, into the different depths. Okay, um, and I think that was my last slide. Thank you for thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for some some questions. Thank you, Andreas, for this very nice and interesting talk. Um, do we have any questions? Instead of like, you know, seeing around two walls, like I, I'm trying to think about it, to like what extent could you use it to instead like non-line of sight, see like the back faces of things, trying to create like a like a full 3D reconstruction of a scene instead of like one side of it. Like do some areas in these like 3D scenes, like how many bounces would it require generally to pick up any scene? I guess. Um. I think it's a very interesting, a very interesting question, a very interesting problem statement. There hasn't been a ton, and there, I've seen a few papers where people actually ask the question saying, here, yeah, I have an object mm -hmm. and I don't want to see around corners. I just want to see all of it. So I want to see the front and the back. And then I have to, maybe I just do LIDAR in the front and on the side and back and try to, they, I've seen some deep learning. This is a good problem to throw at deep learning because it's integrating two very different resolution kind of data sets where the back is always going to be harder to see than the front. Um, yeah, but it's a good problem statement. I haven't seen a lot of um, Prasanna. Yeah, exactly. Prasanna did, did a little bit uh, of like the whole reconstruction. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, in, in, in principle, yeah, you could try to like in integrate like more bounces and, 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 and see the whole scene. And I think that would be really useful, even if you can do it at low resolution, right? I mean, like right now, the process of like 3D scanning this room involves like moving a setup like to do lots of different corners, so you get all the occluded, occluded of, or like just doing slam. Like your your Roomba has to drive through your house multiple times until it kind of knows where everything is, and then if you change something, it's going to get confused, right? So if you could do all of that in one shot, 
of just seeing the entire geometry, that would be very useful. But yeah. I think most people right now just focus on, okay, I'm it actually even too much focus on this very simple setup, like one plain wall and here's the object and let's not make it any more complicated than that. I think we have to get away from that. Like we did a little bit of like what's this is really what's not planar, um, but yeah, people have to get like to a little more more complex question. Thank you. Then we up for the virtual way space of the non-exact imaging, what is the lateral and long shield resolution and which other factors determine this? So um the resolution um the the resolution is essentially determined by the phasor field wavelengths you pick, right? And then you can just do really. So it depends on the size of the relay wall you have, which gives you the aperture and the phasor field wavelengths you pick um, in, for the lateral resolution. So basically, in this situation, if you have a two meter wall and you're two meters away, it's about the wavelengths, right? So if you pick a, like, we, we usually go four or six centimeter wavelengths, which gives you around that the resolution, and then it depends on, on distance, right? It's proportional to distance you go further away. Um, and um, um, the depth resolution is is very good. We can, um, if, if, if it's just a planar surface and there's nothing going on depth-wise, I think we can do easily do sub-millimeters because we have a picosecond laser and in depth, it's, it behaves like a, like a LIDAR system. Um, but that's, I mean, the, the, the virtual wavelengths in a way is a choice, right? You can just easily say, okay, I just take this data and reconstruct it at a lower virtual wavelengths. And um, um, of course that depends on whether that, that band with signal is still there captured by your hardware, right? So you can try to push, there's a lot of, um, if you try, if you write an online side paper, try to not do this where you, where you take simulated data and then just uh, use people. People like don't introduce the, the the bandwidth limit. They don't. They don't limit the time resolution. They just say, okay, I'm, I'm making my time bins in my detector, like one centimeter, and then I'm reconstructing. And then all the methods, um, the, the 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 methods have like built-in resolution limits, right, for for real systems, and they only reconstruct at a certain quality. And then they show that their method can do better on simulated data. But if you just change the virtual wavelengths on, on simulated data in these, if you don't have noise and if you don't have like a band limit, they'll reconstruct whatever wavelength you choose. Um, but then, yeah, it depends on the, on, the, on the data. But yeah, so four centimeters in practice is about what we use with virtual wavelengths. So we have one online question, which uh, I think adds a little bit to the basic understanding. And then I have a follow-up question to that actually. So um, the online question is, um, what are the required optical properties of the wall? And I guess this is in terms of, you know, surface roughness, volume scattering, and so on. Yeah, so um, the assumption that we that we, that we we put down when we first, like, published and said, okay, this wall is Lambertian. We assume it's Lambertian. And then, like, uh, people say, well, what, what if it's not? And the object also is Lambertian. I already showed you that if the object is specular, it doesn't really change anything. <laughs> and the similar is true for the wall. It's, like... The, um, the, the algorithm mostly depends on timing, right? So if you get enough rays to your object, right, the, the, the surface properties are not gonna change the timing. So it's just a matter of, of probing it from enough different angles. So um, if the um, relay wall was a perfect mirror, you may get a situation where, I think that, I, I think I, I played this back in my head. If the object and the relay wall are both mirrors, then you don't get enough diversity anymore. If either the object or the mirror relay wall are specular, completely specular, you, your reconstruction will still work. Then, of course, you might ask if the relay wall is a mirror, why would I want to do all this? I can just look at it in the mirror. Um, uh, <laughs> but there's not really a lot of uh, constraints or requirements on the relay wall. As I said, we have also published some papers now about non planar relay walls, right? If your relay wall has some kind of complex shape, you, you, we 3D scan it in the process, right? So you can use that in the reconstruction and still reconstruct the scene. Um, if it's not uniformly bright, that I don't think that will cause an issue. The BRDF doesn't really cause an issue. I mean, you could design weird relay walls where, like if the relay wall was a perfect retroreflector, you wouldn't even get any light into it and see, and then you can obviously know it. Or if you had some weird engineered structure where what it's actually reflecting to the scene is very different from what you send in, then you could break it. But I think most natural surfaces 
will work just fine. So I had a question about your virtual wave method. Mm -hmm. um, are you reconstructing the full phase field or the complex field? Um, yes, okay. we're, we're computing directly. We just, and, and again, we have this impulse response and then just convolving into this complex wave packet. And from that point on, it's complex. Yeah. That's your scanning with the laser scan, right? That is a complex field. Uh, that's so delta. It's, it's that's not complex. That's pulse, right? But what <laughs> you get in response is not just a direct output. It's, it's a bunch of pulses. But yeah, that's that's the, the response of the scene in response to the delta. Intensity information. That's There's purely no intensity, intensity, exactly. So my question is that let's say you scan at 500 nanometers, mm -hmm. right? The walls can be Lambertian or super Lambertian at that. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to reconstruct, let's say, a 10 micron, those same walls can become much more specular, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not capturing sort of the BRDF aspect of it, which you would if you were recording the complex fields, you know, at the 500 nanometers. Yeah, so, so, exactly. So, so there that leads me to this next question. If you are going to reconstruct at a lower wavelength, then might as well scan at 10 micron. Right, where the problem is going to be much easier because the walls are going to be more spectral. So that's actually very interesting. So we, we, we maybe should so so for the non of side, I, I think I understand the question. For the non of side, so this virtual wave is about combining two. You have this carrier wave, right? That's high resolution optical wavelengths, and then you have the virtual wave that you use to reconstruct. And I think that splitting up into real and virtual wave is conceptually important, right? Because in order to reconstruct the scene at whatever, three centimeters resolution, you need to know where on the relay wall your photons were detected with a resolution that's better than that quarter wave, right? So if you only only have one wavelength, you can't simultaneously do that, right? You can't, you can't, the, basically the a, you, you need to characterize the, the relay wall with a resolution that's better than the virtual wavelengths. And by definition, you can't reconstruct anything with a resolution that you, you need, you need, you, you can't reconstruct it at that wavelength with that resolution, right? So, um, so I think you need to combine these steps. That's the trick you use to break through the scattering barrier, right? So you, you use your, your carrier, your optical carrier to, to localize everything on the relay wall just before it hits the scatter exactly with better than your virtual wavelength resolution. And then you use your virtual wavelengths to do the imaging. And the, the trick then is that you can characterize um, what's happening on the relay wall at a resolution that's better than your virtual wavelengths, which actually allows you to reconstruct. You're seeing more blur than expected is because you're missing the phase information of the higher uh, frequency scan, right? Because it's just purely intensity. And there is no way you can create that information at the lower wave. We have the phase of the virtual wave, right? That's just timing. We do have that. We'll measure. Because the virtual is just processing, right? You can't add information just by processing something. So if that phase information is missing, which is, you know, you can manifest that self itself in terms of spectral, right? As you're mm -hmm. uh, you know, theorizing, then I think if you if you record the complex fields at the shorter wavelength, then you should be able to, you know, project that to the lower wavelength. There is no missing information. Mm -hmm. right? Because the, the, the BRDF part is not being captured. They're just looking at the, the density, I, I suspect. Yeah. So anyway, we can discuss that more. Yeah, we should. We should. I mean, that's a very interesting, like, kind of, kind of question of fundamentally because it's a good question. There's a lot of ways, a lot of things you can do to image these kind of occluded spaces, right? And the good question of thinking, okay, is there anything fundamentally about this, like, two-wave approach that is needed? Um, that that you that, that you and and again, what what is still missing is what what are you actually missing and can we fill it in somehow? I do think there is inform, important information we're missing about the hidden scene that is kind of unburied in the carrier that we could try to pull out. Um, and yeah, I I think that's a very interesting like thing too. I have one last. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Actually, I have a question about your first topic, the uh, single photo uh, in the dial. So uh, I just wonder right now, uh, because from the slides uh, of the of the pen, it's about like 32 times 32 pixels. I wonder right now, I can't go like larger, like normal um, uh, single sensor um, 
yeah. I have this question because if I don't get it right, uh, if I don't get it wrong, so instead of counting the total number, total numbers, it counts the uh, phone phone duration time. And does it mean that uh, this dial has to be a little bit like large to have the sensitivity to capture one by one? So then what's the large dimension or pixel uh, counts of temporary this uh, SPAV? And I have another follow-up question is about, because you didn't mention about the wavelengths, I wonder does this dial um, uh, have the, what what is the response uh, corresponding to different wavelengths? Okay, so the wavelengths is, is easy. It's a silicon CMOS, so it's the wavelengths response curve. It depends a little bit on the geometry you choose and where you put your junction and everything, but it's roughly the same as a regular CMOS camera. So it goes like a, a front illuminated like like normal like this gets goes about up, up to about a 50 percent quantum efficiency in the green and then it drops fairly fast towards the blue and a little slower towards. the curve looks very similar for spat and then if you do a back illuminated you can get up to like 90 percent or something um spats also have the problem of fill factor which is there's there's a bunch of problems with spat that are current technology issues a fill factor is the issue that the SPAT has a lot of electronics that it needs with the pixel for processing and storage and everything. And in the normal, like kind of legacy CMOS process, as you are still using them, I think everybody's transitioning, you have to put that next to the pixel on the same plane, which means the actual pixel is fairly small. Only 10% of the camera's actual pixel and everything else is not light sensitive. There's the 3D stacking. Everybody's actually, even for CMOS, they're all going to 3D stacking now to put some processing behind the pixels. That is solving this fill factor problem. And there are sensors out there that 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 already already solve it. So that's the um, sensitivity wavelengths issue. Let me see. Uh, I had. Let me let me put this. So there are um, commercial. Let me put two here. This slide is kind of old. I, there is a newer one somewhere. I couldn't find it. Um, so the iPhone lidar is also 32 by 32. Uh, Sony has a. I think 100 by 600 pixel array that they have for LiDAR that is out there on the Mauser catalog and you can look at it. And then if you ask for information, they don't respond because they they they, they only talk to you if you wanna buy a billion. Um, so they're looking for an application. And I think Moet has close connection to the Sony manufacturer and they, they're kind of pushing it off. I don't know, they have it. Uh, Canon is making this three, 3.2 megapixel sensor, similar situation. They want to ma market it for night vision. So you can buy it. I do think the processing they do on it is not very exciting. You just get something that looks very much like a regular camera. But you, you, I mean, there's proof that, that you can build these. The fastest one that is kind of interesting that is there's a one megapixel is made by Pi Imaging. Um, and then um, 32 by 32 is really the, the largest that, oh, well, no, there's a hundred, like Horiba Flamira is one, 92 by 128 pixels. And that actually allows you to read off the exact time tag information of all the photons. The, if you make larger arrays, and that's really the big challenge in this entire field right now, is you get too much data to just read it all off. So you have to think about, okay, how do I now compress this? How do I, how, how am I more selective about what I actually do? So all the larger arrays make some kind of trade-offs. They don't give you all the information. I'm sure there are like more questions, but uh, Andreas is available for questions after the talk. Um, thank you all for attending. See you next week. Yeah.